Good day, Jeff. Welcome to the Agile Atelier podcast. How are you doing today? I'm very good, actually. Thank you. Yeah, the sun's out. It's a gorgeous day. Yeah, and today's topic is change management and organic agility. Um, so mm -hmm. I'd like to start off by addressing the general concept of change management. Um, could you tell us briefly what exactly is change management? Hmm. Well, I suppose you'd, get, you'd probably get a different answer depending on how many people you asked. I mean, when, when, uh, when I used to work in some of my earlier organizations, the phrase had a really negative connotation. It's almost like change, uh, change avoidance. Um, it was always associated with slowing things down because change was seen as something that was bad, that was painful, that was um, to be avoided. And those sort of phrases of, you know, people, people hate change. Um, and change in a, in, a, in a project was always expensive as well. But for me, it's more, uh, change is inevitable, um, whether we like it or not. You know, trying to, trying to stop change is a bit like, is it like the uh, is it King Canute who tried to stop the waves? I'm not sure whether that's a, the right thing. But uh, to me, it's more about continual readjustment or uh, continual coherence or recoherence, so that we can we can at, at, at least cope with the inevitable continual change that we're finding around ourselves. If not, use it. Yeah, so you hinted at sort of the different levels of change, right? Um, and when we're when people talk about change management, that can be applied to the team level, the uh, individual level, or the organizational level, or something in between, right? So, are there, you know, how do you sort of um, look at the different levels, and what are the main differences? I think it's pretty fractal. I think it's you know what applies at the individual level applies within the team and within the, within the organization. I think if you're looking at things like culture, to me, culture is just a collection of experiences, a collection of behaviors, values, things that we expect of one another, things that you know, we typically tell each other uh, and, and we do necessarily without thinking. Um, and so if I'm changing what I do as an individual, then that's gonna have an impact on what the team does. And if the team changes what they do as a collective, that changes what the organization does. Um, and it can flow in lots of different ways. So if we set expectations and we set standards and we set you know, model particular behaviors or values, then that gets picked up by others within the organization. So, you know, I'm changing as, a, as an individual inside of work, outside of work. The team is constantly changing whether, we're, whether we like it or not. So uh, I think it's more of a case of whether we're consciously changing or letting change just happen to us. Yeah, and as you spoke to earlier, you know, you see it as a, a fractal uh, aspect to it, right? Um, but what, just for the sake of semantics, um, mm -hmm. you know, is there a line that you draw between a change and say something, what would be called a transformation? You know, it, is that also just a large scale change or do you draw the line somewhere? Um, I think this is, um, I'm, I'm making this up in my head now to, to try and get across what I'm thinking. So for me, a transformation has an end point, something that you, you, know, you know you are then something else. So a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, they have transformed. Mm. Um, but does that mean that the, the, the caterpillar or the butterfly ceases to change from then on? No. So is the transformation still going? It's, it's a hard, you're right to use the word semantics. For me, I used to use the word transformation a lot when talking about organizational cultural change. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, I think I was a bit naive thinking that we would become a noticeably different organization. But to carry on with the, the sort of animal type metaphors, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more like boiling a frog. You don't realize what's going on because things are so slow and the the changes are so subtle but when you look back after a while you may say yes from where we were we have transformed but it's more of a continual transition i suppose um rather than any concrete okay now we can switch the light on and we burst out of our cocoon and we are a completely different organization or i am a completely different person yeah yeah so 
you know, for any team or organization out there, maybe assessing the changing environment or the changing technology, um, you know, they realize that they need to maybe come up with a different product or come up with a different process of way of working. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe guide us through what that journey would maybe look like? Or have you experienced um, taking a team or an organization through that journey yourself? So there's, so there's different, different aspects to it and different levels to it. So when you talk about creating a new product, that, that sort of change, the, the, there are two types of change there. There's, there's the sort of pivot, if you like, um, or there's taking repurposing. So taking what we've got and reusing it, whether that be a service or a component or a complete mm -hmm. or a product and use it for a completely different purpose. Um, but then there's the, what does that mean for the wider organization? So when I'm, when I'm working with product leaders, product managers, I, I'm looking to help them use an agile approach to test and learn, to, to fail fast and to get all the, the information from the market as quickly as possible to reduce their waste and get value to their users as quickly as possible and then learn and so on. And an organizational level, I think there's got to be an element of coherence as well. If you want, if you want to use approaches such as agile product development, then you need to have those values and principles built into your organizational culture to be really authentic and, and to have integrity. And so what I, what I do there is, is I try and help leaders to visualize their organizational culture as it stands now, and then think based on a few factors, a few criteria, um, what kind of culture do you think would be more supportive to the types of approaches that they're looking to encourage and foster and values and behaviors that they're looking to encourage. And then to just constantly check in with themselves and with their people and with the data about whether they're doing more of the kinds of things that amplify the right kind of culture in their mindset. So I don't, I don't suggest picking a particular model and following it. I don't suggest picking a particular set of values or a, a process and saying, yeah, apply this. It's more a case of continual refinement, continual adjustment so that you're continually in line with what you want to be and what you're capable of being at that point in time, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned uh, the word model a couple of times, right? And when people uh, look into change management or introduced to it for the first time, there are a couple different options out there, right? And you seemed uh, quite model ag agnostic in your earlier comments. So has that, you know, has using a certain model helped you uh, get started with a specific change in the past? Uh, or, or do you use maybe different models for different situations? I, the first model that I ever came across was, was Cotter's model, mm -hmm. um, the, the eight step model. And there's a lot I like about it. The, the actual steps I like, um, I, I would perhaps change some of them and not, not use all of them all the time, perhaps. But for me, the, the only real sort of issue I had with it was that it, it tended to make change out to be more discreet than I think it is. There is a sense of before, during and after. Whereas I see change to be a lot more fluid and continual. So I buy into the steps, but more as sort of principles rather than discrete steps. Got it. And you also touched on culture um, mm -hmm. in, in your answers a little earlier. Uh, how do we, you know, culture is something that's usually hard and challenging for organizations to assess. Uh, you know, do you suggest certain ways of assessing it or tracking and measuring it so that you can maybe do the checks and do the frequent checks uh, that you were talking to earlier? Yeah, yeah. So um, within the organic agility framework, we'll, we'll, we'll use a tool called an org scan, uh, which is, is really quite simple, but it's built upon um, complexity, complex, complex systems um, theory. And basically what it does is it captures a load of data points of real examples of events that, that are happening and have happened within the organization, decisions that have been made, how they were made, why they were made that way, the impact of them, how quickly they were made, you know, who made them, what kind of level of involvement and engagement there was in them. And these lots of little micro decisions can be plotted um, against some competing values that can 
really quite interestingly create a visualization of that organizational culture. And there are some consistent patterns that emerge of organizational cultures and the shapes that those, those dots, that data tends to provide. Uh, and that, that visualization generally makes it a lot easier for people to be able to deal with that intangible thing mm -hmm. that is culture. Um, so generally speaking, we're operating on the principle that you know, we, we tell stories about what happens and stories are what are transferable and stories about what happened, what, what goes well are things that we try to replicate things, stories about things that don't go so well are things that we try to avoid again. Um, and it's not that those stories are good or bad per se, but are they relevant and useful to the kind of organization that we're looking to become in the context that we find ourselves in right now? So yeah, we, we would help the, an organization gather lots and lots of data really, really quickly. And then in real time, as more and more decisions are being made, input them into the, into the data and see how that cultural shape, that visualization of the organizational culture is changing. Almost, on a, well, could be on a daily basis. So I'm really curious to sort of get a picture of what this looks like. Is this a plot or is this a diagram that's automatically generated as you put in uh, these, these points and feedbacks? Yeah, so it takes it, it takes a combination of uh, sort of Kinevin theory, mm. Wardley mapping, um, and complexity theory, and the competing values framework as a baseline. So imagine a, an X Y axis with four quadrants um, and lots and lots of dots all over the place, and then a four point shape. It could be a, a rhombus, a diamond, parallelogram type shape that's, that's that, de that depicts the shape of that organizational culture. Mm. Okay, so similar to a radar, right? Where you can see yeah. maybe where you are lacking or what you're doing well and work yeah. on that. Great. Um, and, and you mentioned the organic agility framework. That, you know, that's also one of the big topics for today. Can you tell us about um, you know, the origins of, of the formation of this framework and um, what it's helpful for? Yeah, sure. So um, it's difficult for me to... to to tell you about the origins without sounding like um, I'm doing somebody else a disservice, but it was generally a dissatisfaction with sort of the agile scaling approaches that were available um, about five years ago. And it was just a sense that for me, it, it didn't kind of sit right, that the scaling framework seemed to be almost anti-agile, if you like, yeah. uh, of, of a, you know, this is how to organize your organization top down with this structure, with these roles. And it just didn't, it didn't sit right with me. There's something felt a bit wrong about that. Not evil wrong, just incoherent. So we tried to, tried to sort of model the values, if you like, model the principles. So a couple of people, we collaborated. Uh, so Andrea Tomasini of Agile 42 in, in Germany and Dave Snowden of the Kinevin Framework. And you know, we, we came up with um, a way of, trying to just first of all see where you are because for me any kind of change starts with you've got to know where you are yeah um, and, and so being able to visualize that in some way both at an organizational cultural level but also at a leadership level so what kind of leadership am i providing right now and what kind of leadership do my people need from me right now throughout the organization uh, and then giving them a, a, a way to incrementally tweak that culture based on what Snowden would call the next adjacent possible, right? So this is where we are right now. Where could we go next? And we could do more of this and less of that, and that would give us more of what we want. So the organic agility framework is is looking at culture and, and an organization through the lens of an organic metaphor rather than a mechanical metaphor of a machine where you, you crank up the dial and you get more of something, you know, efficiency. Um, whereas an organic metaphor, you know, an organism isn't really focused around efficiency as such. It's, it's focused around being effective and continuing to remain effective in a complex environment. You can only really get the benefits of, of, of a machine when variables are stable. So if you have a predictable input, then you can focus on getting a greater uh, return or greater yield from your output. But in a complex system that involves people and, and perhaps software or product development, there are lots of unknown unknowns and change. We need to be continually 
effective rather than efficient. So this was the organic agility stands for growing organizational resilience. So OR organizational resilience. Um, by growing autonomy, because in, in complex systems, we need to we need autonomous units to be able to make decisions quickly without having to think, go things up, up the chain and back down again. And nurturing an interdependent culture so that all that autonomy doesn't lead to us going off in different directions and you know, undermining each other or, right. or conflicting with each other. I'll so, pause in case you, that I'm just waffling too much there. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I want to ask you about uh, the, the structure and the setup, right? So you talked about mm -hmm. the difference of, you know, this organic approach versus a more mechanical approach that's focused on just efficiency uh, within mm -hmm. the smaller units. Um, how do you work on that in this, you know, how does this uh, organic agility framework sort of address that um, at, you know, in, in real life? What does that look like in practice? So it's, it's lots through this it's gathering data. So it's a very, very data centric approach um, in that in that sense of, of, well, let's find out where we are and let's find out what's appropriate for that situation. Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot about um, contextualization and that very few behaviors are good or bad in of themselves. But those same behaviors could be good or bad based on the context. So if uh, in, in a certain situation, it might make sense for me to be very democratic, to involve lots of people, uh, to get their opinions, uh, to make sure everybody's heard and have a fair outcome. But in other circumstances, that might be absolutely the wrong situation. Okay. Uh, sorry, the wrong approach to the situation. Yeah. And so being able to assess and make sense of the situation so that we can apply the right approach to it is, is what we do at a practical level, helping everybody in the organization become more aware of the context so they can act more coherently with that context. And that involves a lot of you know, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, feedback, um, uh, basically getting other people's feedback on, on your actions as well as your own self-reflection to be able to manage the two and marry the two up. Mm. Um, and just as with any kind of agile approach, constantly looking and asking and responding to that data. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's very obvious to me that, as you mentioned, it is quite data centric, but I'm more curious to, I'm, I'm curious about how you go about gathering this data, um, you know, because it seemed like we're talking about both, um, you know, hard data that you can maybe use for points to come up with this picture for the organization, as well as maybe uh, softer data, like the behaviors that you were alluding to earlier. Uh, so how do you go about gathering uh, this data? So the org scan is pretty, um, it, it's, it's very software focused. So you, it's a, a very short questionnaire. We, we shrunk it down because if we're looking to collect lots and lots of data points, we don't want to spend all our time inputting data. So, mm. and actually people don't like having to input data. So it's got to be quite easy. Sure. Um, and quite quick. So we, we've really shrunk it down to a really quite a streamlined process, but it's gathering to, through a web interface or through the app on your phone or your iPad or what have you. Um, a few questions and a few, um, if you imagine a sort of triangle, I'm dragging a little stone between the three points on the triangle to re represent the weighting of, of, of certain conflicting, um, conflicting values or, or options or interpretations. And that, that data is then plotted onto a number of different graphs uh, through you know, automation uh, and the SenseMaker engine of uh, Dave Snowden. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's how it's collected. And that's the, there's the data in terms of um, time. So, you know, how long did it take to make this decision, uh, but also the sort of softer side of data, who was involved in this data? And also, how do you think this was a positive thing? Do you think this was a negative thing? But also the narrative, and the narrative is really important as well. So actually tell me a brief explanation of what happened and how you perceive this to be. Because a lot of the data that we use is a lot more subjective than we would like to think. And there's mm -hmm. no reason why we should try and ignore that or, 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 or play that down because culture is about how people feel. It is how people, and people act based on how they feel. So we need to capture that. And we try and anonymize it, or we do anonymize it, um, so that we can, people can feel honest to put in what they want. But if you imagine that, 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 that graph with all these different dots containing all these stories, each one of them can be drilled down into to look at the anomalies, or you can look at some examples of you know, clusters. 
and, and draw out the narrative and say, okay, so we want more like that and we want less like that. What mm. can we do to get more like that and less like that? Let's run some experiments and yeah. see whether the shape changes. Got it. So there is no sort of uh, ideal for success, ideal shape for success, no. right? That would vary based on the teams and sort of evolve as well uh, for each team as well. It's the context. It's absolutely the context. So this organizational resilience is based on continual coherence. It's about, so this coherence is the key word there is based on the context. What's the most appropriate way to be? What's the most appropriate values, the most appropriate behaviors, the most appropriate expectations. So that, and so we use this phrase motivational debt. Okay. Because how I act as a leader is going to have a massive impact on my people and their motivation so it's not just how i act it's how you expect me to act and the difference between the two so if i came into a to an organization and said right self-organizing teams is is what we need depending on the situation of these two organizations i can have a vastly different response even though i say exactly the same thing so i come into one organization uh, and they are uh the pretty up for it they've been trying to do agile on their own for a while they've got a leader now that comes in and says yeah self-organization that's what we want and the team's like, brilliant this is what we've been waiting for give us that autonomy we want to run with it motivation is high i go into another organization and say right self-organizing teams off you go and this group of people have never had any kind of autonomy before it's always been command and control it's always been you know, there's been a quite a blame culture in there so the sense of taking responsibility is quite scary they're now scared out of their minds thinking self-organization. If I get something wrong now, it's on me, I'm going to get sacked. So there's going to be motivational debt because my expectations of them, they don't feel that they can meet. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what is your approach in that case? Do you then take that uh, as, a, as a coach for yourself to, to work on for, for that team? So again, this is about sensing the situation. So it doesn't have to be me sensing the situation on my own or the leader sensing the situation on their own we can have a conversation about this you know what what, what are you comfortable with what do you expect of one another what would make your work better what would you make you more effective for example and self-organization is not binary it's not we either self-organize or we don't there are different degrees mm. of self-organization that can be negotiated and can be tweaked over time as more and more confidence is, is gathered more skills gathered more tools and, and the environment is more supportive and conducive so it's about trying to find what we're capable of what we want and equally in some cases what i'm prepared to to trust people with at the moment it's, it's this continual renegotiation and uh, exploration of, of mutual expectation yeah so what this sort of takes me back to is um maybe different levels of um maturity questionnaires that I've also seen in the past and, mm -hmm. and used myself. Um, and oftentimes the issue I saw with them was uh, that the answers and the questions themselves, as you mentioned, are quite subjective. Um, so what happens if, you know, let's say a team or an organization um, has this end goal in mind with, uh, with the changes that they want to do, um, and they view that, you know, as something that would be beneficial to them, uh, but you know, with you coming in uh, as an experienced coach or consultant, you realize that it may not be the best thing for this team. Um, what what do you do in that case? Um, so, it's I think it's just breaking down the time horizons. So there's nothing wrong with with saying you know in an ideal world in three years time we'd love to be a, you know, a really fluid, flat, self organizing, you know organization of autonomous squads but getting there overnight is not going to happen so let's let's think where we are and where we could go next and making sure that we're you know supportive of each other along the way and it's not just a case of about around leadership granting more autonomy to teams it's, there's, there's, there's a sense of well what, what would make leadership more comfortable and, and safe doing that and, and likewise so it's for me it's always a conversation about how do we see things at the moment what would what would stretch us a little bit but still feel safe um because when people don't feel safe they're they're not prepared to give their best they're not able to give their best and that's whether leadership or or, or the or the actual functional delivery teams themselves 
So trying to create a safe environment of stretch um, where we can just go a little bit further. And what do we need of one another to be able to make that happen? What am I prepared to commit to you? And what do I need from you in return for us to be able to make that happen? And then we can stop, take stock and think, where can we go next? Okay. Uh, so to maybe give you a more concrete example, the example I was thinking of in my head was, um, let's say you're working with a team as an agile mm -hmm. coach and you know, they, they say that, you know, we want to change, we want to evolve, we want to improve and how we see ourselves uh, improving is by maybe uh, delivering uh, 10 features instead of five in the next okay. two sprints, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in that given timeline, um, we need to increase the output, right? So just to use a very simple example, how do you maybe change that conversation to be more outcome oriented um, and, and rather than focus on the output, right? Because if, if that is the goal, then in that questionnaire, they will think they're doing maybe a few things well that they're not, right? And therefore the, the diagram or the shape that you end up getting um, would be reflective of how they think they're doing, uh, which may be quite different from your views or someone else's views. Yeah, sure. But I mean, you've, you've, you've got the answers to your own question in, in the question there, really. There's, there's, it, it shouldn't be about the actual number itself because that will come if they improve their behaviors. My interest is what would you need to change to become more successful? Um, not what's your new target. And I, I believe that their target would, would be increased if they get better at what they think they need to get better at. So that's one part of it is that self-diagnosis of their opportunities for improvement, whether that be improving on the strengths that they already have in place or remedying and mitigating some of their, their weaknesses or what have you. But self-diagnosis can only really go so far. So I would always encourage other people to be asking for other interpretations of their performance. So a, a 360 style feedback. So from, yeah. from various different parties, how would you, what, what gift could you give us in terms of our performance, in terms of feedback? Uh, that could come from, from a performance coach, from a technical coach, from a team coach, from leadership, from colleagues, from past team members, from any sorts of angles. And as long as that team are able to analyze that feedback in a healthy manner, so not completely denying all the constructive, but equally not accepting everything that people say they need to change mm -hmm. because they might not need to change that. And that's, that's kind of my job as a coach is to help them feel safe to ask for the feedback and then to be able to interpret that feedback in a healthy manner to then make some realistic yet challenging commitments to change yeah. and then see how things go. Got it. And one last question on this topic. Um, while we are talking about, you know, the importance of not only uh, the self-diagnosis, but also getting that 360 feedback, um, what I've sometimes seen in organizations is, uh, you know, a lot of that 360 feedback is uh, cherry picked, right? So if there is a, a line manager or a person above in the hierarchy, uh, they decide that the feedback they're giving is uh, more crucial for the team or the department to hit, right? Um, have you seen that? Have you experienced that? And how do you navigate across that? Well, I think there's, there's a sort of assumption there in terms of responsibility and accountability here. And I think the subtle difference for me in a, in a more organic organization is that that team unit has more ownership and I wanna say pride, if you like, There's certainly responsibility for their improvement so it the actual interpretation of the value of the feedback should be internal to the team rather than as a, as a line manager as it were the job of the line manager becomes a lot more servant leadership rather than um directive leadership uh, as that team matures and so those servant leaders they know that the most important feedback is the feedback that a team can use um, because my feedback could be absolutely spot on. But if that team, for whatever reason, aren't able to hear that feedback, internalize that feedback and use that feedback, then it's useless. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's you know, my opinion on that is it sh it, all effort should be placed on 
this this feedback is for the team's purpose, not for the line manager to get a better team. Mm. Got it. And when we so the the shapes that you mentioned that you do eventually generate with these different data points um, is that I'm I'm wondering if that has different maturity levels or is that how do you go about improving that? Um, do you only look at maybe the points or the data sets where it's lacking and try to improve continuously uh, from week to week, month to month? Um, or are there certain, let's say, maturity levels that you're trying to hit? No, it's not maturity levels because uh, different shapes will be appropriate in different contexts. So in an organization where there isn't so much change where actually there is a right way to do things and it should be done based on expertise we'll have a completely different shape culture you'd expect a different shape culture than one that was based on innovation and engagement and self-organized teams mm -hmm. so it's not so much this is this is a good shape this is a better shape this is the best shape it's a case of right this is where we are based on the kind of environment that we're in do we think that that's that's representative of the kind of values, behaviors, and uh, uh, principles that, that, that will help us be successful. What shape would make us more likely to be successful, and how can we get a little bit closer from where we are to where we would like to be? By the time you've got to that point, actually, you, the context might have changed, the market might sure. have changed, yeah. the world might have changed, right? So you might be then looking for a different shape. And as you mature as a team or as the composition of the team or the skill sets change, you might need to change again. So it, you're never finished. And, uh, and some people take that as a really demotivating message because they like to have a sense of closure. They like to have a target. Mm -hmm. But no organization, look at any successful organization now, and they've reinvented themselves multiple times. Uh, uh, and that's, that's only going to increase as, as, as things go on. Yeah, and to maybe counteract that, um maybe something that could be useful for, for teams and individuals is to have certain milestones, right? So, you know, if they get to uh, a change that is quite visible and it's producing higher quality of output, um, that could be something that they can then also take as good indicators and maybe cause for celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm gonna take this as an opportunity to, to, to plug my new book. I'm not sure whether that was Go on for it. again or not. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do a lot of work with teams and one of the things that you've just pointed out milestones there is that in my, with my new book, Team Mastery, I, I literally have a, a mm. set of cards at the back where when teams hit a milestone around quality or delivery or self-improvement, they, they tear out that card and they celebrate having hit that milestone. Or they can pick a milestone they want to work towards and, and you know, really focus on getting better at that and, and then celebrating when they get there. Because, yeah, all teams kind of similar in a way but they're also all unique and depending on their context one milestone is going to be more important than an, that same milestone for another yeah. team it doesn't mean that that team's more mature or not it just means that that's more important to them in their context right then yeah absolutely and i will link uh, that book team mastery in the show notes as well um to to go back to what you had said earlier about allowing the teams, giving them the ownership and also the autonomy to come up with their own shapes and come up with ways to improve uh, deficiencies that they see. Um, you then also have to establish certain guidelines, right? So that not every team is sort of running around uh, doing different tweaks, but there should be a, a company objective or goal, um, right? So what, what sort of guidelines are we talking about? Can you maybe give us an example? Well, again, this is going to, I'm going to sound like a broken record soon, but again, it's very context specific because in certain circumstances, there will probably be some best practices that just need to be followed. You know, there's no point going around trying to come up with your own ways of getting better. Just follow the best practice that's been laid out. In other circumstances, there are lots of good practices and actually it takes a lot of expertise or experience to know which one to pick. So find the right expertise, find the right expert, and, and, and pick that one. But in other situations, we don't know what the right answer is. And so maybe multiple parallel experiments to find out what the right way to improve is the right way to do it. Uh, it and this comes back to our, our, our conversation from earlier around efficiency and effectiveness. Where things are predictable, where things are repeatable, then we wanna be efficient. But when they're not, 
efficiency is our enemy because mm -hmm. we will have entrenched expertise and we won't actually be able to innovate. So what, what organizations do really to be successful here is they give teams appropriate levels of constraints. So where there is a right answer, you have very, very rigid constraints. When there is perhaps some good practices, then we may be providing some, some governing constraints. So just, you know, within these boundaries or, you know, trying to stay within this degree of tolerance. But then when actually we need to experiment, we want some enabling constraints. We want, we want to allow teams to do this. We want to encourage yeah. them and make it easy for them to, to find this stuff out. Um, so that's, you know, it, yes, we want to, we want to, uh, experiment we want to innovate and we don't want to duplicate necessarily and we don't want to undermine other people and other teams so sharing that information is really really important as well uh, and that sense of well if one team's learned this then another team might find it useful but they might not so one of the things that we, we find really important with these lessons that have been learned is putting into the notes the context so if you run a scientific experiment you will be taking account of the conditions, right? The control sample, mm -hmm. the variables that you've, you've isolated, the ones that you haven't, because you could, you want to be able to replicate that, but you need to keep the variables the same. If they're not the same, if the context is different, then the results you might get could be expected to be different. And so that's, I think it's a really important part to say, I want to learn from what other teams are doing, but that doesn't mean I need to copy them because my situation might be different. Yeah. Um... You, it seems like your child is <laughs> running a little loose back there. Thankfully, it's not mine. It's my next door neighbor. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask about the knowledge sharing part that you touched on just now. Um, do, do you have either something within uh, the framework or outside the framework that, that allows for appropriate knowledge sharing? Because this is always a topic that comes up, right? You know, how much uh, detail is appropriate? for which specific teams, departments uh, within the organization? How do you sort of identify uh, and then also um, sort of communicate that? Yeah, so within the, within the organic agility framework, one of the tools that we use is, uh, is an enterprise transition framework. So it's, there's a, um, basically think of it as a big board, uh, a, a, an organizational level board where we've identified things that have worked for us in the past, and we want to keep those we, you know, even though we would want to change as an organization we're not just completely get rid of everything we want to keep all the things that made us successful and are still relevant but equally we want to try some new things so we've got stuff that's worked for us in the past and we've got some things that we would like to do in the future and then we're going to experiment with some of them in the present so we'll take some of those ideas that we've got and we'll actually craft some experiments and we'll have an experiment canvas where we we detail out the experiments that we're going to run with our predicted outcomes so what's the point in running this if, if we're successful what do we hope to achieve or what do we hope to learn what are the conditions around that experiment how are we making it safe how are we making it cheap and easy how can we replicate it and how can we amplify it if it works well and so and we'll capture that so in a, in a format that anybody can see we, we value this transparency and once we've run the experiment we'll capture the results and the context that those results were obtained in and that will be there for anybody to, to rip, that will then into the past right that's it that's one of our what we call confirmed success factors and it's tagged so anybody can search for it and they can they can open it up and they can see the results from it and they can if they run something similar in different contexts they can attach to it and that's there for anybody in the organization to be able to see right from the ceo threat right throughout the whole organization anybody can see what what's being worked on Got it. And so the notes are then specific to the experiments, the different variables and, and the outcomes that were achieved. Yeah. Got it. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the difference between uh, change management as well as transformations, right? Because uh, in the past, this topic of, you know, what is the difference? How do we approach it differently has come up a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, so, what about smaller changes, right? Um, request for changes to specific uh, features uh, within a product. Uh, do, you, do you go about that using the same framework or do you use a more simpler approach? Um, my personal view is when you, when you get down to that sort of micro level is I try and worry less about whether this is 
a bug, a new requirement, a change request. It's just a piece of work. It's something mm -hmm. that has some value in being done and it has some cost of being done. Um, and I look for someone who, who can take both a strategic and tactical view of the overall value and the return on investment of the work that we're doing and make a sensible, if not perfect, um, sorry, if imperfect decision on which we should be focusing on. If it's a change to something as opposed to adding a new feature, then so be it. But if adding a new feature is more important than making a change, so be it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly pressure. I try not to be precious about that. Uh, I want to try and be you know, objective from a product perspective, from a user perspective, but also from an organizational perspective. Okay, so then you're saying at, you know, at a more sort of uh, ground level, um, for smaller changes, you look at it um, more as any, any new feature or any work that's coming in. Yeah, it's just something that needs to be done against all the other things that need to be done. We'll never have time to do it all. So let's work out what the most important is. Got it. And do you use any, any tools, um, any software? So you mentioned the, the canvas, um, any other tools that come in handy to maybe track or convey um, the lessons learned in, in these changes? Um, not, not particularly. Uh, the, again, these, these tools are changing all the time as well, right? So if you'd have asked me that question a year ago, I'd have given you some different answers. So for me, it's and, and going to a different organization, which is, which is what I tend to do. I tend to try and, whatever, wherever possible, allow people and encourage people to use what they find works for them. It just increases that sense of ownership and engagement and actually reduces the, what would you call it, the sort of time taken to, to, to get up to speed. They don't have to learn yet another tool or piece of software or whatever. Yeah. Um, so unless it's absolutely integral to what we're doing uh, and changing something quite substantial, then I'd rather allow people to, to use whatever method works for them, whether that's a wiki or a Trello board or Jira or Mirror, or whatever, whatever the, the best one at the moment is, I encourage people to use that. Got it. Great. And so I, as we wrap up, I want to ask you just a couple of last questions mm. um, for yourself. What, you know, in the recent, maybe let's say past few months, um, what has been maybe one, one or two of the biggest lessons that you've learned when you've tried to, um, you know, uh, work with, work through a change process with a company or a team? Um, they might be the same thing. I'm just thinking, uh, instead of thinking out loud, I'll just, I'll just talk and see what happens. So the first one is uh, I've, had to, I've had to learn to not assume that I know. I used to think that I was paid to know, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not. I, I, I'm paid to help people figure things out. And, and this is in your role as a coach? Yeah, or as a consultant, I, okay. even as a consultant, it's harder as a consultant, right? Because you, people are paying for expertise. But right. when, when what's knowable is not knowable right now. In fact, what we're dealing with is the unknown unknowns. Pretending that I know is not going to help anyone. And actually, what I need to help my clients do is get comfortable with not knowing and not trying to figure it out, but to actually frame, shape, and guide the emergence. So getting comfortable with, with, with not knowing and then helping others get comfortable with that, I think is the first thing that, that's really, really important. Um, and there was a second, but I've forgotten. <laughs> no worries. I spoke too long about the first one. So it's probably the most important one. I, th I think it was much of a tangent on the same thing anyway. Okay. Um, and, and just kind of curious to also maybe... Um, here a situation on your end, did you, when you maybe started working with uh, a, a team, uh, maybe back in the day, right? Did mm. you take, um, you know, a, either a model or a larger framework and try to apply that um, as, as it is uh, written on the website or in your handout or in the book? Um, have you gone through that journey yourself? Yeah, like I said, when we were at BT, we, we were using Cotter's eight step plan uh, create that sense of urgency and so on and like I said I like it but it was um, it was a bit too it, it life didn't follow those steps nicely 
Um, and just that led to some frustration for me. And I kind of sense that, you know, once you've done step one, you expect to go to step two. And once you've done step two, you should go to step three. Right. But what we found was it was a lot more sort of cyclical. And actually, you take a few steps forward and then you take a couple of steps back. And a different part of the organization would be at step two and one part of the organization would be at step five. And that sense of actually just meeting everybody where they are rather than trying to trying to take something and, 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 and force it through a model and you know walking the talk as it were so trying to take an agile approach rather than applying an agile process so what I mean by that is you know when we started and we thought well let's have a product backlog so we had a change backlog and we prioritized mm. it and we had a cross-functional team we were applying the agile process if you like right rather than applying an agile approach and an agile mindset of saying, well, where are we? Where do we want to go? Try and forget about where we think we should be and test and learn uh, and inspect and adapt. And it's a subtle difference, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a big difference. Yeah. And this is also what I've seen in my experience with uh, the different frameworks and the different uh, scaling frameworks, especially that are out there. Right. It's, it's very process heavy. And mm -hmm. um, even with uh, teams or organizations that want to apply it um, at a smaller scale, uh, as you said, it may not be appropriate for their context. Right. Which means for the product that they're building or for the stage that they're in as, as an organization. So I think, that also needs to be built ground up uh, with with the practices uh, that would be appropriate appropriate for them yeah yeah definitely great um well jeff i think we're getting to the end of the episode did you have any last comments for the listeners no it's been fun i think just you know um change is inevitable and it's it's something that um i was i was given some really I'll say tough feedback, but it wasn't really feedback. It was just someone who f sort of found a little hole in my mindset years and years ago. Um, and so I was, I was quite frustrated. And uh, I was talking about my whatever was going on at the time. I can't even remember the, the content. I just remember what they said about me. They said, Jeff, you seem like someone who only really enjoys, you don't enjoy the journey. You just enjoy the destination. You just want to get there. And I thought, well, I've only just met you, but you've just nailed it. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I was, I was a really impatient person. You know, I just, I, I from one, yeah, I want something. I want it now. Uh, I don't want to have to wait and go through a journey, go through a process. And you know, when you think about it, actually, a lot of the time, a lot of your life you're going through some kind of change journey, some kind of process. And if you're only really happy when you've got there, you're going to be miserable for most of the time. So if you can be, if you can enjoy the journey, then you're onto a winner. That doesn't mean you shouldn't care about the end result and shouldn't care sure. where you're going, <laughs> but you know, enjoy while you're on the path. And cause it's always, it's always some ups and downs, no matter what's happening. So yeah, enjoy it. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great suggestion. And where can people connect with you online? Uh, do you have a Twitter account, a website? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm all over the place. Uh, my, my hub, if you like, is my website, inspectandadapt.com. I'm on Twitter, Jeff C. Watts. I'm on Instagram, Inspect and Adapt. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Inspect and Adapt. Uh, there's probably other things as well, but that's a good start. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. I will link all those in the show notes. And I'd like to thank you for coming on to this episode and chatting with us a little bit about uh, what organic agility means to you. You're welcome. It's fun. Uh, there is uh, organicagility.com is a website where you can find out more information. It's not my website. I don't get any money from, from promoting organic agility. I just like it. So. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome.